Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Aaron Kimball. I'm an engineer at Cloudera. Uh, we do a lot of work with Hadoop. And today, I'm going to talk about a tool called Scoop, which is easy parallel database import and export. Uh, quick show of hands. Uh, in your organization, who here has an online transactional database, uh, like powering your website or something? OK. Who has like a data warehouse? OK. Who uses Hadoop? Few of you. OK. So uh, hopefully, I don't need to convince you all on the merits of Hadoop. I have uh, no slides in here for that. But maybe if we have time at the end, we can answer questions related to that. But um, today, I'm going to talk about how to work with Hadoop and with your database. So databases have been holding an awful lot of our valuable data for the past 10 or 15 years. Um, in an online database, you might have structured tables of up to several hundred gigabytes of information. And these sorts of database tables allow us to do a great many really useful things. Uh, individual records can be updated, deleted, modified. Uh, um, new records can be added one at a time. And all these operations can take place in very complex transactions, uh, where we want to ensure that various invariants are maintained over the lifetime of the data set. Uh, and we don't ever want to violate those constraints even for a minute. These uh, online transactional processing databases also allow us to access information with a very rich language called SQL, which allows us to do a number of very common data manipulation operations, uh, grouping, sorting, uh, filtering your information. But this sort of data access model only goes so far. Uh, there comes a limit with what we can achieve by organizing our data in such a fashion. First and foremost, the scale of data that we can support in a database like this is very limited. If we want to support very large data sets in a relational model, then we have to look towards a data warehouse, uh, which is probably going to be quite expensive. We also have the problem of having poor support for complex data types uh, or large objects. Uh, anybody who's actually worked with a club or a blob field in a database understands exactly how painful this is. Uh, and yet, because we have a database right in the middle of our application, uh, images and all sorts of other information which has no business being there winds up getting forced into this system uh, due to uh, some notion of convenience. And another problem we have with databases is that schema evolution is hard. Adding a column or deleting a column, changing the column's data type are all very heavyweight operations that we don't want to do. We need, we need these sorts of operations to be uh, listed in advance. Uh, we plan very carefully for what schema we apply to our data set. A couple of these problems go away when we look at some of the other solutions that we've got available uh, that we're discussing at this conference. Uh, using MongoDB, CouchDB, then we can store data in JSON-based formats. And there, our schema evolution is very flexible. We can, we can just store all the fields we want uh, of any given object. But these systems don't address a very important question, which is how do we then actually perform batch-oriented analytic queries over all of this complex information? Hadoop is a large-scale batch processing system designed to handle uh, very large data sets. One of the primary strengths of Hadoop is that it can handle complex or unstructured data very gracefully. Uh, all of the data in Hadoop is used without any particular schema. You have user-defined functions operating over the data at every step, so you can infer uh, any structure necessary uh, to interpret your data in the way that it makes the most sense. Hadoop is also a batch processing system. It's designed for very large workloads, which can run for 30 minutes, a couple hours at a time, even a day. And it can perform several of these large batch jobs in parallel so that many different users can share uh, these complicated operations over this large data set. Uh, you don't have the problem where, given some uh, OLAP systems, for example, a single very large query can basically peg the system for eight hours, and other users of the OLAP system uh, aren't able to use this as well. And of course, if we're going to run large-scale queries at, uh, on 
several possibly several terabytes of data, possibly for many hours, then the likelihood that one of the machines involved in this is going to suffer a glitch is relatively high. Another one of the major strengths of Hadoop is that it provides automatic fault tolerance. Your jobs will be are checkpointed and divided into independent tasks, which can be restarted uh, in a very lightweight fashion. The major trade-off that you're making with your Hadoop system, however, is that in exchange for very powerful batch data processing, it's very poor at interactive access. So here's where we see one of the major strengths of a database compared to Hadoop. So we could use both, but how do we use them together? Scoop is a suite of tools that connect Hadoop and database systems. The tools have various operations, uh, predominantly in the, in the area of importing and exporting information. So we can import a table from a database into HDFS, and there we get uh, deep analysis. We can also replicate the database schema directly in Hive, which is a SQL-like system that runs on top of MapReduce. So instead of users having to write queries in Java, they can write a short relational query in Hive, but still get all the fault tolerance and scalability of Hadoop. After our query workload has finished operating over our data and we've boiled down to some final result data set, we can then export these results back into a database for presentation to end users. Users can query an interactive database to select individual records as necessary. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to go over a bit about how Scoop works and how that you would work with imported data. We're then going to go a little deeper under the hood, talk about parallelism and performance, and then I'm going to finish by talking about the impending 1.0 release of the tool. So people who have used Hadoop a lot or have read about Hadoop understand that its major uh, feature is its ability to operate over complex data. This complex data gets stored in HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System. And we can perform large-scale queries over this information, but complex data is often greatly augmented by the presence of some structured data in addition. We can do a query over web logs using Hadoop, for example. Uh, there you have a few relational columns, right? You know, the server that generated the log, the timestamp, the severity code. But then you also might just have some you know, large message blob in the middle that it possibly is written in JSON. So we can analyze web traffic by analyzing logs like this, but much better than simply looking at uh, what web pages some users are looking at would be to augment this information with our logged in user profiles, understanding the demographics of these individuals and how different sets of demographics interact with your site in a different fashion. So Scoop, which is a sort of a contraction for SQL to Hadoop, allows the easy import of data from many different databases into HDFS. Once the data is in HDFS, it makes it much easier to write a MapReduce program which operates over both data sets at the same time. As we import data into HDFS, uh, we are going to need to be able to parse that data, um, pull it out of the files and into a form that our Java programs can use. So Scoop will also automatically generate the code required for use in your MapReduce application. As mentioned, it can also import definitions of the schema from the database table into Hive, where we can just run schema-based queries on that information as well. This slide shows an example data pipeline that one might envision running on Scoop uh, that involves Scoop, uh, similar to the one that I outlined uh, a few minutes ago. So we have our web servers on the left side of this screen, and these web servers are generating our access logs. These access logs are being collected by some system uh, an ETL process and injected into Hadoop. We then run MapReduce programs over these logs to extract from there only the fields that we actually care about. For example, what page did the user access, what time, and then the cookie that represents the logged in user. On the other side of this chart, we have MySQL, where we have a table that has tokens for all the users matched to the entire user profile. So using Scoop, we can import this user profile and we can have this user profile injected directly into Hive. After the MapReduce program has finished running over the access logs, we then get something that looks much more relational out of that data set as well, so we also push those results into Hive. There we can run the join, which tells us 
which users are accessing which pages. There are four key features of Scoop that I'd like to highlight. First, it's based on JDBC, which means that it works with many popular database vendors right out of the, uh, right out of the box. We have great support for MySQL, PostgreSQL, and Oracle. All of these are, are tested thoroughly, but by sticking to JDBC, uh, any other standards compliant database should work as well. I know of other people who are using this with SQL Server or DB2. As mentioned, it also automatically generates tedious user side code. So you can, after finishing your import, get right to work and write in the MapReduce application that actually analyzes the data rather than yourself generating a lot of boilerplate code. The integration with Hive allows you to stay in the SQL based environment. And Scoop's backend is very extensible. So we're concerned about performance, and when possible, we take advantage of database-specific hooks so that we can get better performance for those particular imports. An example workflow uh, with Scoop is, is sketched out on the next few slides. We start out with some sort of data set. Uh, consider a table full of the employee records for your organization. If we went into the MySQL shell and described the employees table, we might see that it has these six fields. A primary key ID field, the individual's name and their job, the date at which they started, as well as a department ID code that tells in what division they work. Represented in this table are several different data types uh, for this information. Scoop is a command line tool. So to perform the import, we just have to run the following operation from our shell. We start the scoop program and tell it to select the import tool, as shown in the first line. Then we tell it which database to connect to, providing the URL of the database server, as well as the schema to load, the corp database. And then on the third line, we tell it part which particular table we're interested in importing. This will kick off a MapReduce job, which performs a parallel import of the employee's table into a directory in HDFS. This data can be imported in a variety of file formats, compressed, split into several files, uh, and otherwise conformed to how you need it to look. At the same time, you'll also get back a Java file on the machine where you ran this operation so that you can integrate that Java code into your subsequent MapReduce process. If we examined the output in HDFS, uh, we would see a number of files in a directory called employees representing this table. Some lines out of this file might look like the two shown here. We've chosen to import it as delimited text, so we get all six fields shown in the employees table with reasonable string-based representations of all of the different data types present. These files can then be fed into a MapReduce process uh, per to perform analysis. The class that you would use to perform this analysis was generated for you. So here we have getter methods which allow you to access all of the fields of each of those records in the native Java types appropriate for each column. Not dem shown on this slide are the various serialization methods which are generated so that Hadoop can shuttle this information between mappers and reducers, between the database and MapReduce itself. There are also parse methods that understand text. So you can take this file from this slide here and we can get individual lines moving into our MapReduce process using the default text input format. And then we just call parse on those lines, and we get the file split into those six fields shown here, and the data types have been converted for you. If we don't want to use Java MapReduce, we can, with no additional effort on our part, immediately begin working with this data in Hive. Scoop will take the table definition from the database, transform that definition to one which could create a table in Hive, and inject that into the Metastore there. Then it tells Hive where in HDFS the files have been loaded, and so we can go directly into the Hive shell, run select statements on this information from there. After we've performed some sort of analysis on whatever data we've got, we've got some other data set that represents our final results. So consider a process where we have somehow ranked all of the pages on our website with how valuable they are to advertisers. So we've figured out which pages we should charge more for on the ads. These results might have three columns, some sort of primary key, uh, a string which denotes what an actual page it is, and then a score where the score indicates how valuable this page is to us. We can export this set of results back to a table in MySQL so that our advertisement sales team can then take this information and work with it uh, when talking to clients. 
So we go into MySQL, we create the table that will hold these results, just give it the names and descriptions of the columns with their types, and then we use the export tool in Scoop, again back on the command line. We say Scoop export, selecting the tool we want to run, the database that we want to connect to, this time as a target, not as a source, the table which is going to be the target, and then a directory in HDFS that we want to perform an export into. This export will again be performed by MapReduce so that we have fault tolerance across several machines in parallel to perform this export in a high performance manner. There's a number of additional features in Scoop that provide uh, fine-tuned control over how we work with the information. As mentioned, multiple data representations are supported. You can get your data into HDFS in text files. This is the most basic mode. It's ubiquitous. You can inspect it on your own console, and you can easily import this into other systems like Hive that also know how to interpret delimited text files. There's also a sequence file based import mode as well. Sequence file is a binary file format provided by Hadoop, which offers a number of additional features. It has better support for compression in conjunction with splitting up a data set uh, for parallel processing by MapReduce. Sequence file is also much more appropriate if you're going to perform an import of, say, binary data. If you have a var binary column in your table, you don't want to put that into a text file because then you'd have to do something like base64 encoded or something else uh, relatively awful for performance. Scoop can connect to local or remote Hadoop clusters as well as databases. The tool for Scoop itself can be installed on your local laptop, and from your laptop, you can command an import to occur from a database and a Hadoop cluster elsewhere in your data center. You don't need your system administrator to do anything particularly fancy uh, to get Scoop running. You can also uh, focus the import on a particular subset of your data. So instead of simply importing an entire table, you can select a particular set of columns that you're interested in, as well as a particular set of rows. Scoop will allow you to provide a where clause on the command line that constrains the range of rows that it imports. This is also particularly important if you're going to be doing periodic imports. So if we have a table where we expect new rows to be added to the end of the table uh, every day, then we might do a large bulk import of the table on one day, then we would run MapReduce analytic processes over that data in conjunction with some other complex data. And then a few days or a week later, when more rows have been added, then we can do an import of only the new rows that have been added to the original database-driven source, so we can get that new information in HDFS and integrated in our analysis again as well. There's also a lot of fine-tuning over the representation of data in text files. So we can choose any delimiters we'd like, as well as enclosing or escaping data so that we don't uh, have trouble with embedded delimiters inside the information itself. You can also support conversion of delimiters. If you have an existing import which was performed with one set of delimiters and you need to convert that data set to work with a different set of delimiters, uh, maybe a different uh, business unit in, in your organization imported another table using uh, unfriendly delimiters, you can convert those using Scoop as well. Under the hood, Scoop is a marriage of two technologies. The first of these is JDBC. JDBC is a protocol that allows Java applications to submit SQL queries to databases in a database agnostic fashion. So individual database vendors provide a JDBC driver which you install on your system. And this allows your Java program to simply send a SQL query down and get a cursor back into the results. JDBC also allows introspection of the information held in the database, metadata such as the column names and their types. The other technology that Scoop uses is Hadoop. Scoop allow, or, sorry, Hadoop allows, import, allows input data to a MapReduce program to come from several arbitrary sources, not just files. The way it does this is by using an API called an input format. Hadoop provides multiple JDBC-based input formats that can read from databases, and it can write to an arbitrary sync using an output format. So while these output formats typically write to different file formats in HDFS, they can also write back uh, to a database itself. There's a problem with using these input formats and output formats directly in your own MapReduce programs, however. First, um, 
Connecting an entire Hadoop cluster to your database is going to be a performance nightmare. If you actually have 100 concurrent uh, servers that all connect to a single database server, um, it's very likely that it will catch fire. If the database doesn't catch fire, you've got the other problem, which is that if you have several MapReduce processes trying to work on the same data set, the database is not going to be able to fill all of their pipelines at the same time. So at any given moment, most of the Hadoop-based resources that you have reserved for your application are going to be lying idle because the data will be going to different ones. This makes other individuals in your organization impatient because they have their own analytic queries that need to run uh, on this same cluster. So if you're going to be doing a repeated analysis, it's much better to make a copy of the data in HDFS first using a very limited number of parallel clients and then run the analytic query in the actual CPU bound actions with a much uh, wider uh, HDFS based IO fabric underneath of it. The final trouble with using uh, the database input format directly is that you need to be able to marshal data from the JDBC based cursor uh, API that you get to access the data into a format that Hadoop can understand and marshal around with its own RPC framework. This type of class is called a DB writable. Here's an example DB writable which can interpret a record um, from a database that has two columns. So we have two columns in here. The first of these is a message ID. The second of these is a message itself. JDBC is going to give us back a cursor which allows us to iterate over rows in the database. This cursor is called a result set. So we need to be able to pull one row out of this result set. On lines four through eight, you can see the code that does this. First we pull the message ID uh, out of column one, then the message itself from column two. On lines nine through 13, we have another method that operates on a data input object that allows Hadoop to marshal data across the wire between mappers and reducers. Not shown on this slide are the write fields methods uh, which do the analogous operations on the output side. One thing you'll notice about this class is that lines 2, 6, and 11 have something in common. We've had to define the data type that we're using for this column in three different places. The same is true for lines 3, 7, and 12, the blue lines. So writing these sorts of methods is a very uh, tedious operation and it's prone to errors. Um, individuals might make mistakes and then actually debugging this sort of boilerplate code uh, winds up being a frustrating affair. In fact, if you know the schema from your database, there's a very straightforward translation which is prescribed by the JDBC standard. JDBC SQL data types are shown on the left side of this uh, table. On the right side, we see how we are supposed to represent these data types in Java-based systems. Rather than looking at this table ourselves every time that we want to import a table, this is the sort of work that a compiler should be doing for us. So before Scoop performs an import, it inspects the metadata for a table, performs the type translations, and gives you the Java source back. So here's the basic workflow uh, for operating with Scoop. First, you're going to import your initial table. This is a command line operation. We saw this several slides ago. Then we're going to take the auto-generated Java code, drop it into our own project, and write a MapReduce analysis that performs some sort of analytic pipeline over this information, either in a vacuum or in conjunction with other complex data that we have loaded into HDFS through some other path. Instead of writing Java MapReduce ourselves, we might run Hive queries. Every so often, we're going to re-execute this analytic pipeline. So we're going to need to perform another import using a where clause to import only the new records so that we keep the copy of our data that's in HDFS current with the copy that's in our database. When an analytic pipeline run completes, then we use Scoop again to export results back into the database where end users can perform online accesses to the boiled down information that they need uh, to perform their, their business work. As mentioned, once you have one of these automatically generated classes, then interpreting the files that Scoop has loaded into HDFS for you is pretty straightforward. This is a sample very high level mapping function that you might write into a MapReduce program. 
if you use the text input format, which is how to get individual lines of text as separate records from HDFS, you're going to get an input key, which is the byte offset. That's that long writable K. And then we're going to get the value V uh, for the record itself as a text. Assume that the my record type was an automatically generated class provided by Scoop. You instantiate a new uh, copy of my record, and then we say just r.parse v. This will take the text file, split it on the delimiters that you chose when you perform the import, and convert each of the columns into the appropriate data type. Then you can call your own processing method on just the fields of interest. For example, if we had that message ID and message columns, here we just say get message, and we can extract the particular column that we care about for this pipeline. Parallelism in the import process uh, is controlled by indexed columns in the database. So Scoop will by default use four processes in parallel in order to read from the database. We found that this tends to give better performance than just using a single process, but doesn't actually overwhelm the database's uh, pathway by having 100 clients or more try to connect to it at the same time. Scoop will look at your index column and select the minimum and maximum values for the primary key. It'll then perform uh, linear, a linear chunking on this data set so that if you have a range from, say, 0 to 1,000, we would start four processes in parallel, one that gets row 0 to 250, 250 to 500, 500 to 750, and so on. Each of these worker processes then performs an import operation of its own particular subrange in parallel. MapReduce is used to manage the worker tasks, which provides fault tolerance. So if one fraction of this import fails because one of the worker processes crashes, uh, maybe that machine had a particular glitch, then that particular subset of the import will be automatically re-executed for you by the framework. By splitting the framework in this fashion, we also have the workers writing the separate nodes in HDFS. This ensures that we have plenty of write bandwidth into HDFS to keep up with the database. On the export side, then we use results from MapReduce processing that have been stored in delimited text files. Scoop can read several text files in parallel, parse them again into their particular column types, and then insert these back into a database table by performing parallel bulk inserts. So we might have several export processes, again, four by default, running in parallel, each of which is generating a bulk insert statement uh, for several hundred records at a time and performing these bulk injects, inserts in an overlapped fashion. As mentioned, the backend for Scoop is extensible. We take advantage of database-specific code paths where they're appropriate. So MySQL, for example, offers a couple of tools which make it really easy uh, to get data in and out of MySQL in an efficient fashion. So when we connect to a server where we have prefaced the URL with the JDBC MySQL protocol, Scoop will select a particular code path that instead of using JDBC for the imports, which is a relatively high overhead path, we instead call several instances of MySQL dump in parallel in a distributed fashion. So by using MySQL dump and MapReduce, think of this as a distributed version of MK parallel dump. We use similar tools for PostgreSQL here as well. On the export side of the fence, we use MySQL import. What Scoop perceives as an export, MySQL sees from its perspective as an import. And so each of several Scoop export tasks will open a named FIFO and will then connect that FIFO to a MySQL import process so we can just stream the data directly into MySQL import, performing a much more high performance load. So I'd like to conclude by, by talking a bit about the roadmap for Scoop that we've seen recently and where we're going uh, in the very near future. We've been working on Scoop for about a year, and in last April, we moved the project to GitHub. It started out as a sub-project, or rather a contrib module, of Hadoop itself. However, as Scoop has grown and matured into a project in its own right, it's now being hosted in its own repository. Since then, we've focused on building a release of Scoop uh, that we can then support for a long time. So this, we believe, is our, is our 1.0 release. There have been a number of major improvements in the Scoop's architecture and readiness uh, for this. First, the export pipeline has been reworked to make it a lot higher performance than the one it was using before. So these imports or these exports now uh, batch up data in a much more efficient fashion. 
There's also been a lot of work done to improve the support for storage of large objects. So Scoop now has formats, file formats for HDFS that can hold clob and blob data external from the rest of your relational data uh, in your data set. So you can scan over the rest of your data set without materializing very large columns uh, unless you actually need to explicitly open these objects. We've also refactored the API, rewrote all the documentation, and improved the platform compatibility so that this uh, will work on a number of different uh, areas. Apache Hadoop 0.21 is the next version uh, coming out of the Apache Open Source Project. We expect that to be ready uh, hopefully in a couple of months at most. And Scoop will work with that. Scoop will also work with the next uh, release of Cloudera's distribution for Hadoop, CDH3. Pretty much as soon as I come back from this trip, I plan to actually fork the branch for 1.0 and uh, QA that and get a release cut. So hopefully this will be ready in time for the Hadoop Summit uh, at the end of June. There's a number of bugs to fix, features to add. If anybody wants to help, uh, I'd strongly encourage you doing so. It's an open source project on GitHub, Apache 2 licensed. S most database import and export tasks involve a lot of turning the crank. And Scoop can really automate a lot of this for you. Just connect a motor to just turn that crank even faster. So you can download Scoop today. It's part of Cloudera's distribution for Hadoop. So you go to our website, uh, there's download links available. Or if you go to GitHub, you can get the latest and greatest development branch uh, right from there. So thank you all for listening. Uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to take them now. We can also take them uh, online, my email address on the slide. One in the back. Um, if you've already done an export into HDFS, how do you then synchronize updates to the SQL database that have happened since you did the export? So uh, for there, there's two different types of updates that can occur. One of these would be new records that have been imported. Or that have been injected into the database uh, that were not present in the HDFS copy. So Scoop can select a where clause on the command line. So if you knew that the last record you imported was number one million, you just say where ID greater than a million and you're set. Uh, so that is a pretty easy thing to do because in HDFS you sort of append to a data set by just dropping new files into that directory. Um, anybody who's worked with HDFS knows, however, that you cannot modify existing data sets in HDFS. You can't mutate the records that you've already got in there. So this is a much harder problem. If you've deleted records in your source of truth database or you have modified fields of an existing record, um, you're in a much tighter spot. If you know the last date that you imported and you have a last modified column in your database, then you can perform an import where your last modified date uh, was higher. You'll get a new data set and then it's basically at this point on you to then fold that new data set on top of your older one using a MapReduce process. Uh, but currently this has to be done uh, by hand, so to speak. Um, is it possible to import uh, InnoDB um, databases? I mean, In especially when there are transaction involved? Absolutely. Uh, Scoop will, will just connect to MySQL and we'll use either MySQL dump or, uh, or, or or we'll use JDBC and you know, it just runs select statements out of both. So InnoDB, my ISAM, uh, it supports all of this. Um, that having been said, it's running um, these imports in parallel, so they cannot share a transaction so, because they're in different connections, different machines. So the data set that you want to import, uh, you don't want to have mutations occurring to that particular data set while you're doing the import or else you might get uh, possibly inconsistent results. Um, if you need to constrain Scoop to using a single uh, process, then you can get a single threaded import which will be performed entirely in a single transaction and then you definitely do get uh, a consistent snapshot. Um, does the uh, um, export from the database only work on tables itself or can you actually address uh, views or join statements. And the other question is, um, 
um, importing back to databases. Um, it was now asked uh, how it works with InnoDB. Um, considering my ISIM, um, doesn't uh, parallel loading uh, lock one each other, uh, the processes? So to your first question, uh, I believe it can work with views, although some people seem to have experienced some trouble with this uh, recently. Um, but uh, it doesn't currently have support for arbitrary queries. That's something that I'm looking to add for the next version. Um, of course, I'm looking to add a lot of features for the next version, and it's predominantly me writing the code. So if anybody wants to help with this, uh, see me. Um, as to the second question, um, my ISAM does have does seem to have better performance if you use a single uh, exporting thread. Uh, InnoDB, on the other hand, uh, definitely benefits from having um, about four uh, parallel uh, inserters. With my ISAM, I want to say uh, you can get about 60 to 70,000 uh, rows per second. Uh, with InnoDB and using uh, parallel exports, you can push that up to about 85. Um, does it transparently in disable indexes and, re and re enable them? Currently not. Um, that would be an interesting uh, improvement to perform, um, but I don't think it does that. Uh, but it doesn't do that right now, and I haven't looked at which particular database implementations it's, it's worth doing that for, though. Anything else? Thank you all for coming.